And throughout the filming of this video, I neglected to place a 1-6 scale figure next to the model just to illustrate that it is truly 1-6 scale. Otherwise, I run the risk of having some edgelord on YouTube with a World of Tanks avatar telling me that the vehicle is actually 116. It's 1-6 scale. 12 inch figure. My hand. 1-6 scale. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for my 1-6 scale M10 late production tank destroyer. Now this model here was built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I frequently mention in these videos, I often take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 1 6 scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Now this model here is an older build. It's been in my collection for a number of years now. and. I've decided to take it out, dust it off, and do some minor repairs to it. We'll be going over all of the tanks detailing, its background, as well as some of the repairs that were made to it in this video. So stay tuned because there's going to be quite a bit of info coming at you. Before we go any further, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this here is the American M10 tank destroyer. The M10 was a dedicated tank destroyer which was developed by the US Army and saw service during World War II. Now the concept of the tank destroyer goes back to the interwar period where the US Army were trying to figure out doctrinally how to utilize tanks in combat. Their concept of the tank was primarily being used as an infantry support weapon where you have the tank supporting the infantry where the infantry would encounter some kind of a fortification, a pillbox, or any, anything along those lines, the tank's job was to knock it out so the infantry can advance further. Now the tank was supposed to be fully armored and have a gun that can deal with basically anything that it might come across. However, what happens if you encounter another enemy tank? Well, if that's the case, the tank could basically deal with it, but real, or I should say doctrinally, what you're really supposed to do is call in for a tank destroyer. Now a tank destroyer was a dedicated vehicle whose job was solely to go out and hunt down enemy armor. With this type of role, the idea was that the vehicle was to be less armored compared to the standard tank, but have a higher velocity, more powerful main gun, and have the ability to be faster and more agile compared to the tank counterpart. With this type of vehicle, the idea was you can sneak in ambush and knock out the enemy threat and then retreat and move away to another position repeating the process. All American anti-tank tank destroyers that were developed and fielded during World War II utilize this concept which is why we see vehicles like the M18, the M10, as well as even the M36. All three of these vehicles basically have the same type of idea in mind. All of them are open topped to allow complete 360 visibility, which allows them easier to spot and engage a target. The armor on them is a little bit lighter compared to what's found on the Sherman, but with this lighter armor, the vehicles have a higher velocity main gun. With the M10's case, it was the 3 inch 76 millimeter. And with the M10's case, it had more speed compared to the Sherman counterpart. Now the M10 for the base vehicle was utilizing the drivetrain and lower chassis from the M4A2 Sherman. The M4A2 utilized dual diesel engines which were hooked up together and this gave you your main power pack. The remainder of the suspension and the transmission were standard M4 Sherman compliant which gave the M10 fantastic inner parts commonality with the other vehicles that were in theater. Now this model here is quite significant to me in my collection. The build itself is an older build. It was first started back in 2007 and was finished in early April of 2008. Now the model itself started off as a rotomold plastic kit from Battleground Vehicles, also known as Plastic Panzers. Now, if anyone is a fan of the channel and have watched a lot of my videos since 
I first started posting on YouTube, you'll note that this is not the first time I've done a model showcase video on one of these M10 tank destroyer builds. A number of years ago, probably about 10 or so at this point, I completed a late production M10 tank destroyer very similar to this one here for commission. Videos of that model can be found on the ECA channel as well as in the video description listed below. However, that build would not have never came into existence if it wasn't for this model that we have here. This was the very first 1-6 scale M10 tank destroyer that, I, that I've ever done and all the other M10s that came afterwards were basically built on the foundation that was laid by this guy that we have here. Now this model here is also very significant in two other ways. First, for an ECA standpoint, back in 2007 when I started this model, the ECA catalog wasn't nearly as large or as diverse as it is today. Components such as the VVSS suspension, headlights, taillights, all those other gizmos that we basically all know and come accustomed to that's found on the catalog today weren't really in existence yet, or if they were, they were in a more primitive form compared to the ones that we see on the catalog currently today. A very large number of the components that are found on this model are either one-off handmade components or are pieces that were cast in resin. We'll be going over a large chunk of this information in this video as well as discussing if the parts are either still in production or have been phased out and replaced with newer components either cast in resin or have made the transition to 3D print. Now to put things in perspective the 1-6 scale military vehicle kit market was very small if non-existent. At this time there were probably a handful of customizers out there and small time outfits that were producing fully assembled pre-built one-off models for individuals but these came as again fully completed turnkey builds that detail wise were a bit on the softer side and were sold at a premium because of their handmade status. These models were comprised mainly of materials such as fiberglass, wood and I believe in some rare cases even metal and plastic but again like I said before these models came as pre-built renditions. Well, Battleground Vehicles decided to enter the market, but rather than going with a fully built one-off model for people, they decided to sell their models as unassembled kits, where you just get a hull, a turret, some basic running gear, and the remainder of the model's detailing is really up to you. Now, one of the biggest problems that 1-6 scale kits had for many years, and arguably even still today, is the development of the costs are very cost prohibitive. Because of the sheer size of these components, trying to make components in injection molded plastic is very, very expensive. Now, over the years, a number of companies have come up with several concepts and design solutions to overcome the cost of developing a kit in this scale, namely parts to comprise the hull and the turret. Some have went with laser cut metal, ABS plastic, but for this kit's purpose, the company went with a material called rotomolded plastic. Now, the idea of using rotomolded plastic for large scale models like this was actually first envisioned by a customizer and GI Joe collector by the name of James D. Simone. James D. Simone made several small GI Joe type toys made in this material, and they were very cost effective. Well, Back in 2003 or so, James decided to release a M4A3 Sherman tank in this medium. The tanks came out, but because of their limited detail infrastructure that was out at the time, they weren't really that popular, and the material did need a certain skill set to work with. Most of the individuals at that time were mostly used to working with things like polystyrene, and working with rotomold is a little bit different. However, the Rotomold concept was a good one, and if you knew what you were doing and had some good detail accessories to go with it, you could actually polish it up into a very nice piece. After the lukewarm response from the community, from the Sherman, as well as several of the other models that Mr. DeSimone released, the company and the rights were sold to another individual who opened up a new firm called Battleground Vehicles. They went ahead and took the Rotomold vehicle and expanded the line even further, creating a large number of 
very unique subjects that were not going to be touched by other manufacturers. Such vehicles as the Puma, the Priest, the M3 Lee, and in this case, the M10 Tank Destroyer. Now these models were produced and made it to the market in the 2005 time frame. However, the response was basically lukewarm. People either really liked them or they utterly despised them. The running gag at the time on the 1.6 scale forums were that they referred to these models as milk jug models because of the material that they were made in. Now, one of the advantages that Rotomold does have is that it gives you a very large surface area that is hollow and it's an all-encompassing piece, i.e. there's no panels to assemble, there's no upper and lower hulls to fiddle with. The entire upper and lower hull is one solid piece and it's nice and hollow on the inside. The kit comprised of the hull, the turret, boat made in this material, you receive a basic set of non-functional VVSS suspension. I believe the kits originally came with injection molded plastic track links, which I'll go over in a minute, and that was basically it. If you, oh, and some kits even came with a wooden dowel for the gun barrel that was turned. That was all you got with the kit. Everything else was on the hook by you, the builder. Now, around the 2006 time frame, the owner had a mishap with his production company where they mistakenly used the wrong color plastic for his kits. He had a small run of kits that were made in a neon green Christmas type coloring as opposed to the dark olive drab green that he's required and specified. Well, because of this, he had an extra run of a handful of these units and he sold them off at a massive discount where for 150 bucks, you get the turret, the hull, no barrel and no running gear. Now, when I first saw the offer, I was immediately interested and jumped on it right away. You see, I've already built a couple of the Rotomold Shermans prior to this build here and I had some really good results with them. These models do have a lot of potential to them, and if you know a thing or two about scratch building and know exactly what and where to change and modify things, you can come up with some really good results. So I went ahead and acquired the kit, and finally it was time for me to jump on it. Now when I built this model here, YouTube wasn't a thing yet. The world was a very different place from what we know it as today. At the time, if you were doing anything 1-6 scale related, you were on the forums. Such forums as the 6th Army Group or the 6th Division to name a couple. During this build, I decided to actually build and document my progress as I went ahead. So every week or so, I actually did a, a complete write-up with photographs describing what I was doing and how I was doing it. Much in the similar way of the way I do these YouTube videos today. If you watch any of my 1-6 scale project update videos, those are nothing more than a video version of my old forum posts that I used to do back in the day. Well, this model here, it was actually the first model that I went with that type of a format. In the past, I would build a model basically in secrecy and post some pictures of it once it was finished. This one here, I did a different, a slightly different format. By documenting as I go along, the community saw exactly how to modify and adapt these rotomold vehicles, improving them in almost every single way, bringing them up from a laughing stock milk jug type model to something that is a nice, beautiful piece to, towards anybody's military vehicle collection. In addition to that, at the same time, I was tooling up the necessary components in order to get the model up to the standards that you see it here. So every week or so I would have new parts, new molds made, new castings finished off, and the model just fleshed out, again, much the same way as you see it in the videos. After this model was finished, it had such high reviews and high popularity on the forums that it basically changed the opinion of the community towards the Rotomold vehicle. No longer was the Rotomold vehicle deemed to be a throwaway, you know, act of disparity because you really want a vehicle but you just can't get one or you can't get one for the price of some of the pre-built ones. Instead, these things became a viable platform in order to enhance and further upgrade in detail. And that was really all thanks to can opener that we have over here. And to further rub salt into the wounds of the detractors of these kits, right around the time this kit was completed, I actually entered it in a IPMS model show and at said show this model here won not only first place but also took home the best of show award as well so 
it was a really nice feather in the cap for battleground vehicles at the time. Now, battleground vehicles is still in operation today, but be it in a more limited role. They still produce and sell the legacy kits such as the M10 Tank Destroyer, the M3 Lee, and the Puma, to name a few. Their URL is listed in the video description below. Now, the website is a bit on the dated end. However, they still are shipping models whenever orders are placed. I actually know of a couple individuals who purchased M10s from them very recently, and they got their kits in no time. So, even though the website may look a bit on the boomer end, the models are still shipping whenever orders are placed. And before I forget to mention, all of the photographs and information that I mentioned during the construction of this build are still archived on the internet today and can be found on the eastcoastarmory.com website. On the link listed below, we'll take you to the gallery that is a whole webpage dedicated to this particular model here, as well as its construction. Now, after the model was completed, it was placed on display in the collection in the one corner of the shop, and it stayed there for basically 10 or so years. Now, even though the model wasn't really touched or handled very much, some of the details began to fall off throughout time, and this is true for when a model begins to age. This is true for just about every small-scale plastic model out there, but it's, again, true for the big ones as well. So, for a while I've been wanting to take it out, dust it off, and to patch up and make any small repairs that need to have been made. Well, in addition to that, in recent years I also now have a new display area where it's a better dust-free and debris-free environment where it's a better place to keep a model like this on display and that's where the model's going to be going after the filming of this scene. Now, when it came to what was damaged and what was repaired, I'll be going over this once I start going over the details of the model. And, well, with story time now out of the way, let's go ahead and do that. Let me bring the camera in closer so we could start with the model's functions. Now that I have my rubber gloves on, we could do a proper model showcase video. So, starting with the suspension, the VVSS suspension are all comprised of resin castings, and on this model here, they are fully functional. These resin castings were my first foray into making a fully functional VVSS set, and these sets here are actually technically a one-off because the builds that came after this one here, I went ahead and took the VVSS and modified them further, making them better detailed and also still keeping with the functionality of them. These units are definitely the predecessor to those sets, and the M10 here was actually the first 1-6 scale model that I've done in a static configuration with a fully functional suspension set. This would be a feature that I would incorporate on many other builds that came after this unit here. The set does have its nice spring bounce to it. Now, if anyone's wondering, well, the tank is static, what's the point of having a functional suspension? Well, it's quite simple. If you put the tank on uneven terrain, the, art, the suspension is going to articulate, and this really does two things. First, it looks better overall for a photograph, but more importantly, it puts less wear and tear on the tank itself. If you have the model and you have a rigid suspension set and you're putting it on an uneven surface, all of that weight is going to be focused on one or two key points which can put extra stress on a suspension swing arm or some other type of suspension component which can possibly lead to, to the unit cracking and breaking on you. Functional suspensions are a huge plus even if the tank is static like this one is here. While on the VVSS, you can see all of the foundry and casting numbers. This is a trait that would carry over into the production sets of the VVSS suspension from ECA. Now for the roll wheels, we're utilizing the late pan dish type roll wheel, which was actually the first roll wheel I developed for the VVSS Sherman. Moving forward, it takes us to the sprocket. Now the drive sprocket is a resin casting from Panzerwerk. Now on the original battleground vehicle kits, they had a deal with Panzerwerk where Panzerwerk would supply Battleground with his late VVS pattern of drive sprockets. And these drive sprockets are awesome. They have fantastic external detailing, but the internal detailing is also nicely rendered. If Hopefully I can get it in frame. But they have the little fasteners and rigidity strips found on the inside section over here, which is found on the actual units. Now, this was a short period of time because <laughs> in years that came after th these generations here, Panzerwerk and Battleground Vehicles had a small little falling out, but that's really something left to another video.
Moving rear takes us to the rear idler. Now this was a rotomold component that was supplied with the Battleground Vehicles kit and was recycled and utilized on this build. The trick, however, was with the construction. Now, like I said before, rotomold is a hollow casting material and that was no different from this wheel here. But in order to mount it to a center axle, what I went ahead and did was I filled the entire hollow cavity with casting resin. Once the resin was poured in and solidified, it made the wheel nice and solid, and this gave it a fantastic point in order to drill and bore out the center hole for the spindle for the rear idler mount, as well as a lock pin to keep everything in place. Now, moving our way to the tracks, these tracks here were actually kit supplied with this model, and they are exquisitely made and actually were of really good quality. They were made from ABS plastic components. The pad itself was two halves, and then you had the two teeth on the end which were also separate pieces. You would cut steel rods, a lot of steel rods, in order to pin them together and this basically is true to form for just about all of the 1-6 scale Shermans on the market. Even if anyone has the Dragon plastic 1-6 scale Sherman, I recommend doing this exact same procedure in order to get the tracks assembled because the little snap-on ones are just junk, but that's something I guess for another video as well. Now these tracks time absolutely perfectly with the Panzerwerk sprocket, in fact the model does roll very very well with this setup here now because of the perfect timing this kind of led the contention with battleground and panzerwork and was really the source of the falling out but again that's something left for another video for another time from there it takes to the front transmission housing and this area received a lot of work to bring it up to the way you see it here the original plastic panzers hull has this unit integrally molded in and it does have the basic overall shape of the cast transmission cover but it could use a little bit more work this unit was built up with lots of epoxy sculpting it to the shape that you see here for giving it its final overall look as well as its cast texturing which you can see here now over here we have the final drives obviously these are absolutely required in order to fit on the pans work or any type of sprocket now these units are actually scratch built counterparts that i've done myself in future builds, I went ahead and forego scratch building these bits and replaced them with the units from Panzerwerk. Panzerwerk does have these final, or I should say, did have these final drives cast in resin, and they were exquisitely made and were a perfect drop-in solution. For this model here, for one reason or another, I just went with a scratch build route. It's also relevant to point out that the Panzerwerk sprocket and the Panzerwerk final drive were designed as a set to work in unison together, and once you mount them on, they give you the correct spacing required from the final drive. Moving back towards the center portion of the transmission cover, you can see the added detailing. Now, some of these details are standard on the Sherman family, but others are more specific for the M10 series. Starting with the tow hook mounts, these ones are standard Sherman, and these pieces here are fabricated out of chunks of resin and were just one-offs made for this build. Now, if you look on the corners here, you'll see these bits of brackets that have been added. These are step are step sections where you can actually put your foot on to climb on top of the vehicle. Now, while on that note, the M10 has this specific unit that we have here. Now, these units are found on the regular Sherman types in several different sizes. Some are actually integrally molded towards the side section here, and this one here is the later type where it's just a little bent piece of steel that would be welded. But on the M10, it just seems like that most of those vehicles always had this type of a setup where it's a it's a basically like a little step ladder built into the transmission cover it is comprised of two pieces and on this model here these two pieces are made from soldered bits of steel they were then mounted to the model and sculpted weld beads were added to complete the look while on that note another m10 or m36 family specific part is this guy that we have here this is another step section that is welded to the front transmission cover. And again, it's just one of those fittings that seems to be more prevalent on the M36 and M10 family of vehicles. Now, moving from the step points takes us to this little clamp. This would be a tow cable clamp and is found on just about all of the Sherman variants. But on the M10, it's in a slightly different location. On the Sherman, it's more in this spot over here. But on the M10, it's a mirror image. Now, this unit here was one of the ones that have been offered on the EastCoastArmory.com catalog for a number of years. However, in recent months, the old set has been retired and phased out with a new set which is entirely comprised of 3D printed components. 
The new set looks almost identical to the old legacy item, and you can see exactly how the old one evolved to the new versions that are being offered today. Moving up takes us to the fastener strip found on the transmission cover, which is an iconic piece of detailing found on the Sherman. Now, this bit of detailing here is an ECA resin component and is one that's still offered on the product line. On the stock Plastic Panzer's kit, the molding and detailing is very soft and poor for this bit of equipment, which is a trade-off on the Rotomold material choice. You do get some nice big castings, but the molded and surface detailing is going to be on the rougher end. Rather than trying to salvage it, I simply replace it all together with the resin one that gets dropped in and then it gets flared and blended into the remainder of the casting found on the transmission cover, giving you the look that we have here. From the transmission cover now brings us to the tin work. Now the M10 and the M36 were very specific with their front fenders. As a matter of fact, they were the most unique front fenders found on the Sherman family of vehicles. They're the only ones to actually feature a hinged mud flap design. Now the ones on this model here are actually comprised of real sheet metal that are bent, folded, and are all soldered together, giving you the very unique geometry found on these parts. Now these units are currently offered on the EastCoastArmory.com catalog, but don't be surprised in future months that these will eventually be phased out with 3D printed counterparts because of the time required and the effort required to actually fabricate these units from sheet metal. However, you can see exactly how they look on this model here. Now while on the tin work, it's because of the unique shape of the M10 and the M36 hull design is what warranted this unique pattern of fender work. Now, the tin work is unique specifically on the M10 because it continues all throughout the lower section here of the vehicle. Now, to the untrained eye, one would think that the armor actually comes all the way down and bends over, but that's not the case. On the real vehicle, the armor actually ends at this point that we have here. From this section onward was actually thin steel gauge plate. On the real units, this basically acted as a side skirt and prevented or mitigated, I guess, a lot of the kick up of dust or other debris from the tracks when the vehicle was in motion. Now, on the real M10, you would have this little strip that we have over here, and then the thin gauge metal would actually be welded to this section from underneath. Also, on the real M10, there are several vertical braces that descend down from the upper hull, or I should say the sponson that reinforce and make contact with this little sand skirt that we have here. Another thing to point out is if you look at a lot of post-war usage of the M36 Jackson, namely in Indochina, or even during the Korean War, you'll notice that they amputated and cut away a lot of this section over here, making better access and room to get to the tracks. Now on the Plastic Panzer's kit, this was one of the sections that needed to be improved upon. The kit has this little section pre-molded into the upper hull. Now this can lead to problems visually because when you assemble the suspension and put the track on, the track is going to be directly below this lower section here that descends downward. Well, in order to address it, it was actually a very simple one. I just basically totally concealed it with this little strip here of plastic. Now luckily the plastic panzers, or I should say the battleground vehicle kit, the molded in piece was on the shorter side, which was great because then it just allowed me to add the thicker, or I should say the wider section here of plastic, giving the model the correct look for the upper hull here. It conceals most of the track, which is as per the real vehicle, and I didn't have to do any other sort of cutting or modifications. The stock unit is still there, but it's thoroughly concealed and covered up with the what would be tin work on the real vehicle. The same is also true for the rear section here, and you can see how it continues with this portion rearward. Now on the rear section actually came to be a blessing because on the real M10, there is a cutout in this portion for clearance of the exhaust manifold, and this was more easily done because I just extended the lower portion down further. The amount of material removed basically is where the stock plastic panzers unit originally was. Now while on the rear section here, you can see the idler mount. These are the rest and cast units that are still offered on the eastcoastarmory.com website. Only on this model here, they were literally brand new. In fact, I developed them for this model specifically. 
detail wise they haven't changed one bit and look identical but what has changed is the section that the idler mounts to now if you notice on this model here there is a little bit of slack to the track and that's because of the way the idler is mounted on this model here there's no idler adjustment capability the mounting rod comes directly from the idler mount through the rear idler and ends in this section here that's concealed underneath this cover cap now on the vehicles that came a few years after this one i went ahead and modified the design of the idler mount system to have an adjustable tension idler mount the idler mount detailing itself is identical to this one over here it's the same mold same castings but i just add an extra bit of equipment to give you that adjustability nature to it. Now for this model here, I'm not going to be redoing everything and I'm just going to keep it as is because the track tension is good enough for what it needs to be. Back to the rear of the vehicle takes us to the remainder of the detailing which consists of the toe points on either side here. These are just again one-offs fabricated from chunks of resin and then we have the toe hitch assembly. Now the tow hitch assembly consists of three components. We have here the tow hitch mount, the tow hitch extender, and the actual tow hitch. Now for the longest time, all three of these components have been offered on the EastCoastArmory.com catalog. However, within the last year or so, the tow hitch itself has been completely phased out and replaced with a new 3D printed counterpart. The old one here is still fully functional, as are the new units. And soon, I'm going to be phasing out the tow hitch mount that's found on the current catalog. Now on this model here, the tow hitch mount is slightly different compared to the ones found on the Sherman. If you'll notice that on this unit, the top and the bottoms are both plugged off with a piece of steel plate, while on the Shermans, they are actually hollow. This is just one of those small traits that I've noticed while studying the M10 tank destroyer. Now from the tow hitch brings us to the exhaust manifold, and this is one of the more unique aspects of the M10. Because the M10 utilizes the drivetrain from the M482, it has the same twin diesel engine setup and you do have the same exact exhaust manifold. Now this exhaust manifold is a resin casting and is listed on the EastCoastArmory.com product line. The units are still in production today and I don't see a need to replace them anytime soon. Further up you can see some of the interior detailing where we have some mesh work. Now on the real M4A2 or the real M10, there would be two large radiators mounted directly behind the meshwork that we have here. However, on this model, there's no interior engine compartment detailing, so the radiators are just not present, but the protective mesh screens are. Note that there is a center bulkhead that segments out the two sections on the compartment. Moving up from the exhaust manifold takes to the rear plate detailing. Now, a number of the tools on here are scratch built and some of them are cast and resin. Oddly enough, the current US AFV tool sets that are found on the EastCoastArmory.com catalog were made specifically for this model that we have here, namely the sledge and the pickaxe head. The other components are all one-off scratch builds, which would include the pry bar, the shovel, which is actually made from metal for both the spade and the handle end, the axe, and the wrench is actually the current off-the-shelf unit from ECA and was added when I was repairing this model. You see, when I first built this model, I did not have this piece developed yet, and this was something that I developed later on. However, I did have the tool mounts fastened in place as they should be there on the real vehicle, and when I was cleaning and refurbishing the model I had a spare unit in my stash from the which was an off cast I couldn't use it for sale so I might as well clean it up and use it on this model here I went ahead and painted and weathered the unit in order to blend in with the remainder of the tools that are on this model as this model is built in a time when my weathering techniques were a little bit different than you see on more contemporary builds that are listed on the channel and on the website so in order to keep everything within continuity I went ahead and use the same system that I used all those years ago. Now on the axe section, on this mount over here, it popped off from age. This was repaired, bring it back to the look that you see here. Now while on this corner, at some point there must have been something that rubbed up against it because there was a small paint chip in the section and this was just blended back in with the paintwork. Moving up further, you can see the tail lights as well as the tail light brush guards. Now these tail lights were the original opaque resin sets which were found on the ECA catalog for a number of years. They were eventually phased out with clear resin 
inserts made in resin and now within the last few months these have been completely and utterly replaced with sets made from 3D printed components. The brush guards are currently for sale on the catalog and are made out of soldered together metal but these two are also going to be phased out at some point. From the taillights takes us to the lift points. Now the lift hooks on this model are actually made from bent sections of aluminum rod that were then mounted to the rear plate and blended in with the with the epoxy that we have here. Now on unit on builds that followed this one, these were replaced with cast resin components that have the same look and slightly better detailing. And those are the units that are still on the catalog as of this filming of this video. Back to the tools, you can see the tool mounts. Now all the tool mounts are fabricated out of bits of metal and this has not changed even up until today. Still fabricated in much the exact same way. Notice on this rear section here we do have some fasteners going down the section. This is true for the M10 family and we do have the little tie downs that are found on the real vehicle and on the real vehicle leather or canvas straps would be used to secure the tools in place preventing them from working loose while the vehicle's in motion. Now this would be a detailing that you would see on more of my recent US military vehicle builds, but on this model here, I'm just gonna leave it the way you see it. Note on the, on the large wrench, we do have a chain retained lock pin holding that section in place. Moving, our, moving along to the side of the model, you can see the side hull detailing. Starting in the rear here, we have the track rouger racks, which are an iconic bit of detailing found on the M10 family. Now the racks themselves are comprised of all metal components that are soldered together and are actually bolted to the tie down points that we have here on the sides, which I'll go over in a second. The grousers are also made from cast resin and these are units that are listed active on the catalog today. Now, over the years, some of these grousers fell off due to the old glues and I was able to piece most, pretty much all of them back together again with the exception of one of the units that we have over here. One of these units were lost to the sands of time so I went ahead and found one that was left over in my spare resin precast buckets. I took the piece out, cleaned it up, painted it and again utilized the same weathering techniques that I did originally in order for everything to blend in. And I'm not exactly going to say which one fell off, I'll let you decide. Now moving on from the grousers takes us to the other iconic bit of detailing found on the M10 which are the hard point mounts. Now on the M10 there are several mounts found on the front, sides, and the turret and these were for an applicable armor system that was to give some standoff protection of the armor plate and giving the vehicle a little bit more protection but for one reason or another these plates were never really developed or were ever fielded but the hard points were still there and stayed on the M10 all the way up to the end of its life and even through the M36 Jackson. Now although the hard points were never utilized they were utilized in the back here for the mounting of the grouser racks. I have seen several other vehicles in field where they would tie bits of string or wire that they would use to string up camouflage netting of one sort or another. So there were some usage for these hard points other than the original intended purpose. Now the hard points themselves on this model here are or were components that were offered on the eastcoastarmory.com catalog. They consisted of these little resin hard points that were pre-welded. You glue them where they need to go and you also have bits of metal fasteners. However, trying to get the metal fasteners these days have been actually pretty difficult. I'm not sure if they even make this size anymore. Because of which these units are probably going to be phased out in favor of 3D printed ones that will look visually identical to these units here. From the hard points takes us to the foul weather driving hood mount. This little rack that we have here is found on all of the M10 and again the M36 tank destroyers. Now this part here is all comprised of metal components that are soldered together. Now this piece is a ECA catalog item, however it's also on its way out to be replaced with a 3D printed counterpart. Moving our way to the front plate, now this is the one section on the model that is one of the areas to improve upon. Now the plate that you see here is not the rotomold section that was originally molded into the piece. That is still there but it's underneath this panel that we have here. What this is, it's a quarter of an inch plank of plywood that was coated in fiberglass resin and fitted to the front section here of the model. What this does is that this gives you the sunken appearance for the transmission cover. It's also straighter than the original 
roto molded part. And it gives the model a more beefier look, which makes it look more realistic compared to the stock molded counterpart. Now, you can notice it has the mounting nubs found on this front section here. And by the way, all of the nubs are a certain pattern. On all of the M10s and M36s, they all follow the exact same format. From the hard points, this now brings us to the lift rings. These here are, just like the ones in the back, handmade, fabricated out of aluminum bar and mounted to this model. Moving down further, it brings us to the headlights, the brush guards, and the siren. Now the siren is a catalog item and is still in production today. And the headlights, however, are a primitive version which would eventually become the rest of the units found on ECA. These ones here were modified from another light that I used to offer, and I would modify it into the shape here of the US AFV bow headlight with the blackout light. Now, these units have been improved from the original one that was mounted on this model. Originally, the lens was a handmade vacuum formed dome piece, and this little blackout section here was not present. In its place, I just had some clear epoxy molded in to form a lens. At the time, I thought that this cover was just a blackout cover, and below it was just a standard bulb, which is not the case. The original vacuum formed lens was not holding up very well. I popped them off and replaced them with a straight off my catalog piece, which was the clear resin lens section, and that just mounted directly in its place. For the dome, or I should say of the blackout light, I sanded away the epoxy that was present and I replaced it with one of the clear resin blackout lens faces, again from two refuse units that I had in my, in my scrap bin. Now in recent months, the old ECA resin and clear resin headlight sets have been phased out. In their place, a new set have been developed, made entirely of, again, 3D printed components. Those are the current sets that are listed on the catalog. While on that note, this brings us to the brush guards. Now in this model here, the brush guards are all made from solder bits of strips of steel. And these two have also been phased out with 3D printed parts as well. Now, over the years of the model being stored, I believe one of my cats probably brushed up against this part because the brush guard did have some damage to it. Some of the glue joints popped off and there was a bit of chipping found in this section over here. These were all repaired, glued back together, and the paint was then all blended back, leaving for the appearance that we have on this section. While on that note, on this weld bead, on this portion over here, this too seemed to crack off for one reason or another. I went ahead and re-sculpted the missing section of weld with the same epoxy that I used originally and just blended everything back in with the paintwork. Moving along to this section here of the vehicle. Now the M10 does not have a mirror image of detailing found on the lower hull. On this side here, we have the antenna base, which is an MP48. This is the typical ECA antenna base and it's still offered today in pretty much the exact same format. The only change that I made was on this section that we have over here, where you see the neural tip found on the top. This was not something that I originally built into this model, but was something I added during the upgrade process. Moving from the MP48 takes us to the first aid kit. This is another ECA catalog item. You notice it is fully functional, but I went ahead and never <laughs> fabricated or added the first aid kit itself. Now, this is another one of those items. It's currently listed on the catalog, but is more than likely on its way out. Moving along the side hull detailing past the grouser rack, takes us to the tow cable mount. Now, this is the same type of mount that was located on the transmission cover. Moving further, takes us to the tow cable cleats. Now, these are active components found on the ECA product line and haven't changed. From here, you can see the armored ring. Now, the M10 was unique in that it had a large armored ring found on the top portion here of the top deck, and the units that we have here are another catalog item found on the ECA catalog. From there, it takes us to the engine deck. Now, the at this portion here, you're basically looking at an M4A2. Note the small diameter engine grills. Now, these grills here are made individually from lengths of brass and are soldered together. This is actually very similar to the way they're done on the real vehicle, only on the real vehicle, instead of being brass rod, they're actually elongated 
brass stri or steel strips that descend into the engine bay, and then a single weld bead is what holds everything together. If you look at plastic models, they like to have a bar that's rendered across these sections here, and that is technically a mistake. In real life, it's not an actual steel bar. It, it's literally just a weld bead. The reason why you see steel bars rendered on a lot of the 135th scale kits is because it's what they can accomplish with the type of tooling that they're working with and with the scale that they're modeling in. But keep in mind, if you're working on larger scale models, even this is also true for the M4A3, they were never bars. They were actually just big, clunky weld beams. One interesting to point out about the engine deck are the grab handles that we have for the engine grills. You notice that they are in this type of a format, and this is true for the M4A2. You notice they bend around the two fasteners that on the real vehicle are used to secure the engine grates to the top deck. While on that note, you can see all the other fasteners found on this portion over here, and all these fasteners are true to form on the actual vehicle. Moving backward, we have a travel lock. Now, the travel lock on the M10 wasn't very glorious. It was just a simple piece of metal welded directly to the plate, and then there was a canvas strap on the inside here just to prevent any marring happening to the gun barrel. This unit is a ECA catalog item and still available as of today. Back to the engine grills, you can see these hinges. These are ECA cast resin hinges, but are used just for show and are non-functional. What is functional, however, are the fuel caps. These fuel caps, all six of them, you know, there's three on each side. This is again because this vehicle has two diesel engines found under the hood or in real life. But these units here are fully functional. You pop the pin, they are chain retained. You open it up, revealing the filler cap detailing. This is the type of thing that is seen on almost all of my US AFV builds. And on this vehicle here, it's no exception. On the opposite side takes us to the fire extinguisher. Now the fire extinguisher itself is the same unit found on the Sherman and a few other American AFV. And this one here is the cast set from ECA, it's, which is still an active component found on the product line. Now if you notice on the M10 it's unique in that it's in this little guarded bathtub. And the bathtub itself is spot welded in a few sections, which is taken directly from a real vehicle. And the front section here has this angle to it, I guess to give you better access to yank on these handles if the need be would ever arise. Also, you note that the handles are painted in red. Again, a common practice found on the real counterparts. And this is true for all of the American tanks with this type of a system, which would include the Stuart as well as the, as the Pershing. Moving forward brings us to the bow hatches. Now the bow hatches on the M10 were specific for this vehicle. And other than the M36 Jackson, no other USAV utilize this design or set. Now, before I go over there, you'll see the sculpted weld beads on all their locations. And on this section here, the M10 is unique in that it has an extra angled periscope here for the driver. This is only found on the driver's side, and if I go across, you'll notice that it's not present for the radio operator. Now, for the hatches themselves, the kit did originally come with hatches molded in, but you can imagine they were quite on the basic end. In their place, I went ahead and tooled up my own hatches out of cast resin, and these units are still offered on the EastCoastArmory.com product line. They have their both interior and exterior detailing. The only thing not included are the interior periscope detailing, which on this model here are from PanzerWork.com. However, a similar set is also offered, but only in white metal from Armor Packs. Armor Pax's website is listed below. Unfortunately, I don't believe Panzerwerk is in business anymore or is taking on any orders. Note the little grab handle. Now, also, you'll notice that the way the hatch is open on the M10, unlike the Sherman, where the early production one just opens straight outward and the later ones open to the front, the M10 opens up and actually goes directly parallel to the front plate. This is true for both sides. And it's again another one of those unique traits only found on the M10 Tanks Destroyer family. On the exterior, we have some handles fabricated out of brass. We have here the periscope detailing cover, and we have a brush guard. Now, the brush guards on this model here are made from brass, and these again were a staple found on the ECA.com product line, but have been replaced with units again made from. You guess it, 3D print. Now, one also unique attribute that these hatches have is this little lift, or I should say this little hook that we have here, and this other locking hook. 
on the real unit this would pivot open and it's hard to get in frame but this little guy here would hinge open and lock into that little u-point and that would keep the hatch firmly in its open position this would allow you to drive the vehicle with your head outside at speed without the risk or worry of this hatch bouncing loose swinging over and knocking you out which is needless to say a really good feature moving forward takes us to the turret lift rings which are a unique shape and again are exclusively found on the M10 tank destroyer family. From the hooks brings us to the mantlet. Now this was the kit original unit but was heavily modified in order to the way you see it here. Basically the shape was changed in that the front here was rounded off on the original was squared off and on the real vehicle it would be rounded with its contour. The sides were not exactly square so I went ahead and filled this area in and built it up with some epoxy. And the other detailing all came like the well beads, the little molded in section over here as well as the molded in section for the optic. Notice the optic cover is fully functional and was scr uh, scratch built one off piece. The other modifications came on the inside where I added a tube mount in order to slide over the main gun and also these two lift hooks here were made from aluminum. Note the way they would be welded on the real unit. This was a all in cast section that would be fitted to the mantlet and then just welded in place. From the mantlet this now brings us to the barrel. Now the barrel itself was hand turned from a piece of PVC. Now admittedly the barrel's a bit on the thicker side but this was the best I was able to do with the tooling I had of the era. This now brings us to the actual turret shape itself. Now the turret was the original kit supplied one but was manipulated in a lot of ways. First and foremost, the turret shape. You'll notice that it has this curve on the lower portion over here. This is very important. On the M10 tank destroyer, the turret was actually a giant stamping. It wasn't like on most other vehicles where you know you have separate plates and you, know, you weld them together. Not on the M10. M10, the turret was one gigantic panel that was cut out and then stamped and folded to the shape and then was all welded to keep its shape. And that's why we see here this rounded section on the bottom. This was added and it's one of the most important pieces to add. Second piece to add was on the front trunnion here. The stock kit did not have a trunnion. The section of the turret just came straight down, rounded off, and went right down like this. Well, in order to have the pivot point for the main gun, a trunnion was fabricated. Now in this angle you can see exactly what I'm referring to. There is actually a cylindrical section that goes from this weld all the way to this weld over here and that's where the round section is which is required because one it's on the real vehicle and two it gives you the pivot point in order to have the unit actually go up and down. This was fabricated out of a length of PVC tube with then sheet styrene added to the sides giving it the sealed off appearance that we have here. On the PVC tube it was heavily modified with having sections cut away as per the real unit giving it the proper shape. The next section, which was extremely important, was the rear plate here. Now, with this being a late production M10, the turret's geometry would be as follows. Where, if you notice, it goes up in this section over here. On the mid and early production M10s, the geometry was more of a diamond shape, where we have an angle going this way, and we had smaller counterweights. One of the problems with the mid-production was seeing that those counterweights weren't heavy enough, so they redesigned the counterweight system to the large duckbill setup, and because of that, the rear plate of the turret was changed. Now, on the model here, the counterweights were integrally molded to the turret, and on the top portion, we actually had that infield armor roof, which a lot of crews fabricated. For this model here, the top armored roof was pitched, and in order to give the vehicle its correct turret shape, the rear wall was completely amputated with the counterweight still attached. New panels were fabricated in the exact shape and size which was required in order to fill in the now absent geometry. Once the new pieces were fabricated, which by the way were quarter inch thick panels of plywood, which were then coated in fiberglass resin and smoothed flush, everything was then blended in with the welds as well as with the remainder of the bodywork and the counterweights were then mounted. Now the counterweights received a lot of work. First the original backing that or I should say the original wall which they were molded onto were cut off, cut off completely. Just like with the rear either wheel these were filled in completely with 
casting resin. Once the units were filled in with resin, I then went ahead and started the rework process. First thing I did was I separated them as they were molded as one piece. Then I went ahead and carved and sculpted the inside portions here of both of the counterweights. Now, if you notice, they are left and right hand specific. This is true even down to the casting numbers. The one on the left hand side is E8011, while the one on the opposite side is E8010. The big difference between left and right is also with how the scallops are cut in. Notice on this unit here, the scallops are segmented with a large center bulkhead which separates the two, while on the opposite side, the scallop is one gigantic cutout on this section. This was all again hand carved and hand sculpted with epoxies and other body filling techniques. The remainder of the details, namely these straps, were fabricated out of metal and they are actually fastened to the rear wall via the fasteners that we have here on the inside. One interesting detail about the late pattern of counterweights is this little strap that we have here. Now this doesn't look like much, but it's actually insanely important. The, re the purpose for this strap is so that when the turret is rotating and it makes contact with the antenna base, the antenna base is gonna flex out of the way. And if that strap is not there, the antenna wire is gonna fall right in between these two sections over here and get stuck which is why they added this little plate in order for the antenna just to brush over it if the turret is rotated in its path. It's a very clever and sim very simple technique indeed. Now on the inside, back to the wall, you'll notice that there's a large ovular hole cut out on this portion over here. This is as per the real unit. And I'm still unaware of the actual purpose of this hole. If anyone knows, feel free to put it in the comment section listed below. Now this brings us to the turret interior detailing. All of the interior detailing you see here is either comprised of metal, handmade bits, or cast resin components. Here we have a barrel clamp for a spare M2 HB 50 caliber barrel, which obviously would be changed out if this one is overheating. Note it is in the empty position, and this one here is handmade out of brass and is non-functional. Moving down takes us to the ammo racks. These here on this model are comprised of resin castings. Now recently these were phased out and replaced entirely with units comprised of 3D printed parts. This guard that we have here, piece of, of aluminum, I believe. And here we have another rack on the opposite side. Now note the shells on this model. These are also components on the eastcoastarmory.com product line and have been unchanged since the release of this model here. Over here we have a metal rack. This rack is to house spare magazines for the M1 carbine, and these straps here is where you actually store the M1. In addition to the M1 carbine, a Thompson can also be stored or stowed in the same location. From the magazine holder takes us these large grab handles found on the inside. Down further takes us to what I believe is a map case. Now this is made from metal and is actually fully functional. This was clearly just a one-off piece and it's not something that I've ever made for production, but this may change if I ever do another M10, but more for on that is to come. On this side here, we have the mount for a fire extinguisher. Note it is empty. And we have some other racks and tie downs for other sorts of equipment. Here we have these interior storage boxes for more equipment. All of the configuration layout you see here is as per the real unit. On the opposite side, we have here a mount for a gooseneck flashlight, some more boxes. Note this box here is slightly different from these two. This here is for a panoramic sight for indirect fire. The M10, just like with many US tank destroyers as well as self-propelled guns, can be used as a dual purpose roll. Now, oddly enough, on this model here, I have the mount but not the gun, or the optic. The optic was actually something I recently developed for a M27 recoilless rifle, it's the same exact optic, but for this model here, I'm gonna leave it off. Some more interior detailing. Note the three inch main gun. This unit here is one resin casting, and it's actually sold as a kit, found on the eastcoastarmory.com catalog, and it's still in production as of the date of this video. Here we have the elevation post. Now on the real gun, you would actually rotate this handle over here, and this would rotate and spin this turned rod, which would actually raise or depress your main gun. Over here is actually the gunner station, and in here we have the main optic, which is used for direct fire. Right next to the elevation position is the turret rotation crank wheel. 
this turret is hand cranked, which would I presume be a really laborious task, but that's how it was on these M10s. Now, I believe they were experimenting with a hydraulic system, but one never really came into fruition. By the way, all the parts that I'm referencing are listed on the ECA catalog. On this side here, which would be the loader's position, we have these two locks. These locks are safety locks, and when you engage them, prevents the turret from rotating. There's actually a really cool video on YouTube. I'll probably put the link in the video description, which shows the crew positions in this vehicle when they're getting it ready for combat rolls. First, these two units are disengaged, and the seats are also flipped up where they're out of the way. This is how you would ride into in your transit mode, and then when in combat, these would flip up, lock in the upward position, and then you have more free space in the fighting compartment to do what you need to do. Now, these seats are also on the ECA catalog as well as the turret locks. Note, I also have to fabricate the turret ring because this was a very important piece of detailing which is absent on the stock plastic Panzers unit. The turret ring on this model is very important because it gives you the interior detailing, also gives you the space to mount on the interior detailing components, but more importantly it's what I use to secure and mount the turret to the body. The turret has a lock and key system like a 135th scale tank and this was all facilitated by the neck that was fabricated. Back on the exterior here we have the tarpaulin clips and the rail basically when you would Pre prevent any water or rain from getting inside the vehicle, either when it's being stowed or in transport, a rubberized canvas would be positioned over the top over here, and these units would bend, or I should say fold up and clip into place. Same for the ones found on the rear section. Now this one here suffered some damage over the years, so a new casting was made and painted exactly like the old one, dropped in place, completing the repair. From here brings us to the M2HB. Now the gun mount is a unit on the ECA catalog. Now the M2HB itself is a metal version from the company Dragon and Dreams, or known as DID. At the time, these machine guns were pretty popular. Detail-wise, they're eh, they're okay. They're not the best uh, 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 kit on the market, even though they are made out of metal. Uh, that's a bit misleading. The unit itself, at best, again, is all right. Now the it's sitting on an M23 cradle. Now, at the time, I wasn't able to figure out why the M23 cradle with its ammo can was not working with the M10, and that's because the M10 actually had its own specific gun mount, where the cradle mount sat above the turret in order for the ammo can for its clearance. On the model here, the way I used the M23 is I simply omitted the ammo can. Keep in mind, on the real M23, the ammo can is a tray and it slides directly into this section over here, so having it with this configuration is not necessarily inaccurate. At some point, I probably am going to develop that cradle for the M10, but for now and for the last number of years, this setup here works just fine. You'll notice that on this M2, I mounted on an optic, which would be found on, or was an accessory for the M2HB, and this is another set found on the ECA catalog. With the turret removed, you can see the hull interior now in better view. Note the locking tabs, like I mentioned before, as well as the armored ring. Now I guess we'll start from the front and move our way to the back. This model has a complete hull interior detailing where we have the driver's position, the radio operator's position, here goes the Sherman's transmission housing, the drive shaft shroud, and these two units here, unfortunately its purpose mistakes or is escaping me, but I believe it was the fuel cutoff if I'm not mistaken. With the camera off the tripod and with the hatches open, you get to see the interior now in more light. There's the instrument panel, the driver's position, note the pedals below. We have the stick shift as well as the steering levers. Note all of the headlight electrical systems. And here we have the SRC 508 radio. Now, all of the components, basically the transmission, the seats, the driving apparatus, the, the instrument panel, all of these components are listed on the EastCoastArmory.com catalog. And all of them were designed and tooled up specifically for this build. Moving back, we have some spare headlights. Note, these ones still have the, the original bulb system that I fitted. I'll probably change this out at some point down the road. But for now, I guess it's all right. 
further back, note the interior bulkheads found on either side here of the of the hull. And then we have here our internal magazines. Now in this model here, there's no ammunition stored, but you can see the ammo racks now in clear view. Also, we have a small little conduit guard on this side just to, for more instrumentation and cables to run along the sides of the hull. These bulkheads and these ammo racks are, again, ECA catalog items. Moving back further, we have here our engine oil radiator, another ECA item, you know, all the brass fittings. Here we have the interior floor of the fighting compartment. All the diamond plate is present. On the opposite side, you see I had some spare rounds, so I started mounting them on the inside. Now note how they are fitted. They are in a tandem order. This is, again, as per the real vehicle. Now also on the real vehicle, if the ammunition wasn't exposed like this, it would be in cardboard tubes, which would be piled up and strapped in these four locations found on the inner hull's magazines. Moving back towards the front, you can see here, right below the radio operator's hatch, is the all-important floor escape hatch. That is also a current offering found on the ECA catalog. Now, a common question that I get is, John, what color do you paint the insides of these vehicles? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple, and it's by and large the same for just about all countries' vehicles. On American tanks specifically, the inside would be flat white. This is true, if you notice, for the walls here of the internal magazines, as well as also for the driver and the radio operator's position. Basically, all interior space would be flat white. Where things are painted green are the inside portions of the hatches. These are never painted in white. Now, Someone's probably going to come up with a rare, obscure photograph of the interior hatch painted in white. Generally, this was not done. As a matter of fact, that's more or less an oddity compared to what was commonly seen. And there's actually a really good reason for this. Now, specifically for an M10 tank destroyer, and this is also true for the M36 and the M18, the fighting compartment floor is also painted with olive drab. Now, to illustrate why this is the case, here I have the turret back installed. Now, imagine that this camera here is an airplane, and you're flying overhead. You can clearly see that the hatches, as well as the fighting compartment floor, do not give away the vehicle's position. If those units were painted in white, the vehicle will be able to stand out like a sore thumb and the vehicle's position can be given away. This is why the interior portion of the hatches are always painted in green and that's true even till today. Now with the open top vehicle, this is also again true for the fighting compartment. Now this is only true for open top vehicles like the M10, the 36, and the 18. If you're doing a Sherman, you don't have to necessarily do that. However, I will point out that on some Shermans, I've seen the floorboard of the driver's position painted in olive drab for this exact same reason. But that is really up to the builder's discretion as it can go either way for that one case. And this now leads us to the paint and the markings. Now for the model's paint and camouflage, I went with an Anzio paint scheme, which is the tan painted over the olive drab. Now, when it comes to the markings itself, the vehicle is 100% fictional. This is not based on a actual M10, and the can opener caricature is a creature of my own creation. You know, the stars on this vehicle, I went with the dark painted stars, which was a common practice done in field, as the white stars were something that would probably be easily seen by enemy gunners. You'll also notice that this model here is a lot more weathered compared to the other vehicles that I've done in recent years. This year was just a style of weathering that I was doing at this time. Well, it always feels good to take one of these older builds, dust it off, make a few repairs here or there, and getting the model back up to its former glory. Even though she may not be the newest girl at the party, she can definitely still turn some heads. From here, the model will be placed in its other location, put on display, where hopefully the dust is a thing of the past. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 1-6 scale late production M10 tank destroyer.
If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep updated on new posted content being large and small scale model showcase videos like this guy over here or the other project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been posted on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Till next time.